Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz. Oh, yeah, folks, it is once again Monday evening, December 16, 2018. I am Grimnir. This is the Grim Leftovers program right here live on RealLibertyMedia.com and RLMRadio.xyz, as well as a host of other places that grab the audio stream, those being Freedoms Network and RealLiberty.org, Internet Radio, TuneIn, uh, Shoutcast, oh, just all kinds of places the audio stream goes out to you. So howdy and hi to you all out there. Hopefully you had a fine Monday. Getting ready for them holidays coming up, are you all? Huh? Huh? Are you? <laughs> and let me just say before I go on uh, that this will be the last Grim Leftovers program of 2019. Yes, the last Grim Leftovers of 2019. Uh, I will be kicking off the next two Mondays, which will lead you on out of the year and into 2020, or 2020, as some of you may prefer to say it. 2020, perfect vision. Okay. <laughs> well, let me say hi to all the folks over here in the chat. If you're not in the chat, come on over to reallibertymedia.com Real Liberty and click the little pop-up chat button, and you can jump on here and chat with all the folks that are here in the, in the chat right now. We got we got a bunch of a great group of folks. We always do. We got the barman. We got the beetle. We got Mr. Cowboy Tech out there giving us some false information, telling us he ain't that smart. We know he's smarter than he wants to let on. <laughs> Myself and the Moose Girl are here in the chat. Uh, Miss Kate, hey Kate, how you doing? Uh, down there in the lovely Florida. Anti and Azamo and Chelsea Doni Echelon. Miss Graham Z, hey Grammy. Oh boy, we're well, hoping to get some Grammy shows next year. Some uh, independent Grammy shows. But well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. On that, uh, we got the Java Doctor, hey Java. Mr. Hansel, a.k.a. J. Dredd, uh, Meester Meister Bow, the Ponder Gander, the Poopster, and the Prince, who will be doing their show Thursday evening at 11 p.m. Eastern. Uh, by the way, Ponder Gander, he's on it fri on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern, so uh, check him out. Mr. Rob Works, how you doing, Robert? Uh, Romes, a.k.a. Romes. <laughs> he goes by other names <laughs> as well, but uh, no need to expose all those right here. We got the Vanna White Bot. She's a lovely little letter turner. We have Mr. Vin E, the uh, other half of the Ponder Gander, the Weather Dork Bot, who is now set to insult you because, well, uh, it was just a funny thing to do. <laughs> the Woodman, uh, Phantom, CC66, Joe Skira. Circling with a capital C, capital C circling. I like you like that circling. Uh, all right, the cyborg uh, noodle. Uh, damn, Van Meter, Donna, Donna. Also down there in the Florida town, Florida Vills. E man, Ensive Frumpster from Canada. Hey, Frumpy the Goober from uh, well, not quite Canada, but approaching Canada on the on the left hand side of the country. There, he's he's almost up there in the Canada, you know. Uh, we, we, we got JJ's from Scotland and Pone Sauce, the Sock Puppet, Mr. Puppet of Socks, and Slim uh, Jim Flim, whoever he may be. Uh, we know who Slim Jim Flim is. <laughs> Smart Ass, the holiest of Holy Rogers, and Mr. Zippix. Those are the names here in the chat. I know there's others of you out there listening that aren't in the chat, but uh, come on over. Say hi to the folks. It'll be a good old time, great old time. Uh, what about the ball? Vinny asks, what about the ball? Well, the ball will go on. Uh, matter of fact, and speaking of the ball, the Freakers ball, which happens at Friday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, this week, Friday night Freaker ball, will be the annual uh, Solstice, Christmas, uh, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever. Uh, all those holidays rolling the big one, big the big ball. Holiday ball <laughs> coming up this Friday Friday evening. So get your requests in 
for all of your favorite uh, holiday style tunes, winter holiday style tunes, and uh, we'll try and get them on on Friday evening uh, for you all. Uh, and the following Friday the uh, will be the annual prediction show that we do, which uh, we have predictions from last year, and we'll go through all those predictions and go through them and see who got what right and who didn't. And, and, and there's, you know, generally some pretty good predictions, but there's also some goofy ones in there. I prefer the real predictions over the goofy ones, but, you know, people in chat, they, they like making the, the goofy predictions. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so try and, try and think of something that you think is really going to happen in the coming year and uh, make a prediction here in the chat. All you do is type exclamation point, the word predict, a space, and then your prediction, and then we'll... Uh, uh, we'll we'll have that in there, and we'll record it and, and save it up on the website uh, in, in a local list for next year, and we'll do the same thing in, again next year. But that show will be on the 27th for that, so uh, look forward to the prediction show as well. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. What else? What else? What else? I think that's all. I, th I, th I think that's all. Yule. Yes, the Yule show or the Solstice show or the whatever you want to call it, the beginning of winter show. <laughs> all those things rolled in one. Okay, I got to get going. I got a bunch of stories lined up here. All kind of the fun, fun stories lined up for you all, and let's get to them right now. Uh, yes, these are stale stories. Well, maybe not stale, but they've been keeping kept in, in airtight, safe Tupperware containers in the in in the grim fridge here. Just just waiting for the proper time to serve them up. And now is that time. And here we go. Starting off from ArsTechnica.com, posted on December 4, 2019, a mere couple weeks ago. This this story scares me a little bit. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little afraid of what they're talking about doing here. But they're doing it. I don't think they know what they're doing. They, they they think they know what they're doing. I don't I don't believe them. Attacking agricultural pests with viruses. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I oh man. All right. The phages use a three prong strategy to cripple the agricultural pathogen. Huh. About a third of the food that we grow, along with the F, all the effort and energy of, and labor and resources, there's a lot of ands there, uh, put into growing it goes to waste. A third of, of all that effort and, and, and resources goes to waste. Much of it is thrown out by consumers or rots on shelves, but a substantial fraction is attacked by pests while still in the field. Bacterial wilt infects a number of crops throughout the world, including tomatoes, potatoes, peanuts, and tobacco. It is uh, caused by gram-negative bacteria. Didn't say gram E or gram Z. It's gram-negative bacteria. As with human antibiotics, treating agricultural pathogens suffers from problems with destructive broad spectrum and increasingly ineffective pesticides and uh, just as in humans people have suggested using viruses to attack the bacterial pests phages are viruses that infect bacteria they are highly selective disabling only the bacterial species they specifically target and leaving neighboring bacteria alone since containing species that we want, both in our guts and the soil, uh, this specificity, 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 <laughs> oh, you know the word I'm trying to say, <laughs> it's usually preferable to antibiotics and pesticides. Maybe that indiscriminately kill every microbe they encounter. While the concept sounds good, Evidence that phages are effective has been lacking. New York has just assessed the phage therapy. If the phage therapy can control bacterial blight in tomato plants, 
results so, show that it does so using three related tactics. First, the phages. The researchers used a combination of four, which was more effective than any of them individually, or any combination of fewer, uh, which reduces the number of pathogens, which reduces disease. This was true both in an experimental greenhouse and out in the field. The remaining pathogens develop resistance to the phages, but this comprises another way in which the phages combat the pathogen, through distraction. There is an evolutionary cost to developing phage resistance, so the pathogens that survive grow more slowly. The virulence of this particular blight is dependent on its population size. It can't cause disease until it crosses critical population density threshold. So, having phage-resistant but slower-growing bacteria is a second way that the phages stop bacterial blight. By knocking down the number of pathogens with this one-two punch, pa pa. the phages also open up a literal and ecological space in the soil in which new, beneficial bacteria can thrive. The phages thus promote the more diverse bacterial community that even further projects the plants or protects the plants from disease, since it includes bacterial species that actively help fight off the pathogenic one. The authors note that more work needs to be done to ascertain if the phage-resistant pathogenic bacteria get their competitive advantage back over time. The experiences, experiments linking resistance to slow growth were only done in the greenhouse and only over 24 hours. Still, they conclude, after 24 hours, that using phages for biocontrol and agricultural agriculture shows promise. It should be interesting to see how the how the buying public responds to a label conveying that on uh, uh, conveying that information on their heirloom tomatoes. Now let me just say this about that. They are designing, creating in a laboratory pathogens, phages, which are designed to attack a certain specific bacteria or group of bacteria. Now, I know they must realize, they must know, that out in the wild, these things mutate. And they mutate rapidly. And they, they continue mutating. So, I'm thinking that they're they're going down a a uh, a bad path here. I, I don't I don't think that designing and creating uh, these phages is going to work out well in the end. Now it, it may do what they wanted to do at the very beginning because they've uh, specifically designed them to do a certain thing. But just as with any bug, with any bacteria, any any germ. It will modify itself. It will change itself so, so, that, uh, <laughs> so that it can thrive regardless of what's going on. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a bad, bad plan, if you ask me. It's not... It's not uh, they can't control it once, once they release it. That, that's what it comes down to. Uh, uh, Gooberzilla is asking in the chat... Who decides what a pest is? Well, I, I think most people here in the chat, Goober, have decided that you're a pest. <laughs> Just messing with you, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> but don't worry, we're not going to sick any phages on you. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right, anyway, <laughs> I cracked me up. All right, a few weeks ago was Black Friday. A few weeks ago, December, or, uh, October, uh, November, November 29th was Black Friday. This article posted December 2nd on the Tribunist.com about Black Friday. 
Americans bought enough guns on Black Friday, on one day, that one day, to arm the Marine Corps. Yet again. <laughs> That's right. According to the FBI, over 200,000 background check requests associated with the purchase of firearms were submitted to the agency on Black Friday, marking the second highest gun sales day ever. How many people are in the Marine Corps? I, I have no idea. But is there only 200,000 people in the Marine Corps? I thought there were more than that. I don't know. Uh, but it says that there was enough guns sold on that day uh, to arm the Marine Corps. And this says 200,000 background checks, so A plus B equals C, I guess. Uh, anyway, the previous record was set on the Thursday after Thanksgiving 2016. Both in 2017 and 2016, enough guns were potentially purchased on Black Friday to arm every active, active duty United States Marine. USA Today reported that in total, the FBI states uh, they fielded 202,465 requests uh, during the 24 period hour period. Uh, associated with Black Friday, just under the prior record of 203,086. The background checks are required for firearms purchases from federally licensed dealers. So the number does not necessarily reflect the number of uh, actual number of sales that took place. In some cases, a single background check could be associated with more than one gun purchase if a shopper decided to buy more than one during a single trip. Additionally, not all who apply are ultimately approved, so some applications would not result in a purchase. In 20 states, individuals with a concealed permit are exempt from background check requirement based on guidelines set by the Bureau of Ac Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Woohoo! Party! That sounds like a fun group. Alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. <laughs> anyway, the ATF. So, so, so they could make a purchase without having to send additional information to the FBI, leaving those sales potentially uncaptured by the FBI's background check application data. However, if the numbers were somewhat accurately captured, the number of firearms sold, Americans purchased enough guns to arm every member, oh, here it is, of the approximately 182,000 active duty U.S. Marines. 182,000 Marines. All right. Much of the activity likely, can likely be associated with numerous sales and rebates gun manufacturers and sellers offered on Black Friday. These numbers also do not take into account firearms, which were purchased online. Those firearms will then be shipped to a licensed seller in the purchaser's area, and a background check will be done when they pick up the firearm. So those checks could be spread out over the following weeks. Yeah, baby! <laughs> I didn't buy any guns on this Black Friday. Matter of fact, I've never bought a gun on a Black Friday. I, I I just don't do buy anything on Black Friday, really. Uh, I did get something this Black Friday. What did I get? It was something stupid, something very minor. I, I forget what it was. Something that cost me a couple of bucks, but something that I needed for my personal own use, not as a gift, mind you. <laughs> All right, Detroit Metro Times. Uh, da, 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 da. Is there a date on here? Oh, there it is, December 2nd. Posted on December 2nd. Detroit Metro, or Metro Times out of Detroit. With pot sales now legal in Michigan, officials, the authority, waste no time in reigniting reefer madness. <laughs> reefer madness. Let me just say this about Reefer Madness. If, if y'all remember the old, the original Reefer Madness movie uh, from, I don't know, was 40s, 50s, somewhere in there, uh, old, and, and and they made it look like people who smoked Reefer were going to be murderers and rapists and killers and 
uh, floozies and uh, just just dregs of the earth. If you smoked pot, you were absolutely going to be insane, a lunatic. And and it was uh, not intended as a comedy, but it turned out to be a comedy uh, just because. Now over, I, I don't know when this new version of Reefer Madness came out, but it, it came on to one of the broadcast channels uh, around here over the past few months. And I said, "Oh, look at that! A newer version of Reefer Madness. Let me let me let me re, 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 uh, record that and see what it's about." And so I did record it. And about a month or two after I recorded it, I said, "All right, let's watch this. See what's going on." It was like a freaking musical or something. I couldn't watch the first twenty minutes of it. It was horrible, horrible. I, I don't know what they were thinking, trying to make Reefer Madness into a musical, <laughs> but but it was just it was just wrong. That was messed up. <laughs> anyway, if you if you have the opportunity to see the new version of Reefer Madness, I'm gonna suggest take a hard pass on that one. It's just not right. <laughs> Back to the article. The very same day legal marijuana sales started in Michigan, the state descended into chaos. Or, at least that's what Michigan State Police and the conservative news media seem to want you to believe. It became illegal to purchase pot in Michigan on Sunday. By 9 a.m., Michigan State Police had made their first arrest for driving high after a man crashed into a state police vehicle in Oakland County. The Detroit News tweeted with a link to its coverage of the incident. Yeah, but there are a few problems with the Detroit News version of events. However, as this article notes, the accident happened at 9 a.m., but marijuana sales didn't start until 10 a.m., so connecting in the two events, yeah, not really. No, 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 no such luck there. Furthermore, the accident happened in Springfield Township, some 50 miles away from Ann Arbor, where the state's first licensed recreational marijuana shops are located. State Police Lieutenant Sarah Krebs told the paper that the driver, a 51-year-old man, admitted to smoking the evil weed sometime before the incident. The word before, in parentheses, is due to a lot of work here. How before are we talking? While driving? That morning? The night before? Last week? <laughs> Additionally, uh, police said the driver had been driving too fast for road conditions. Marijuana, however tends to make people drive more slowly. A 2017 report to Congress from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration found that stoned drivers typically drive slower, follow other cars at greater distances, and take fewer risks than when sober. While drunk drivers typically drive faster, follow closer, and take greater risks. Police say the driver was not hurt and consented to a blood draw, but the issue is further complicated by the fact that THC levels cannot accurately be linked to driver impairment due to different tolerance levels in individuals. For this reason, the state-appointed commission concluded that the state should not set THC limits for drivers. Plus, the role marijuana plays in accidents is often unclear anyway, because it can be detected in the blood for days or even weeks after use. This is a reminder that on the day legal marijuana can be purchased, do not smoke and drive, MSP wrote uh, in another tweet. Just like alcohol, use a ride service, designated driver, or stay home. To be clear... We agree that you should enjoy marijuana responsibly and not drive while impaired, if you are getting impaired. But you should also beware of any modern-day attempts to reignite reefer madness. <laughs> the devil's lettuce. Oh, man. <laughs> 
right. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> December 1st, 2019. WGLT.org. Org. This is the NPR from Illinois State University website. Normal police officer, not like he was a normal guy. It's from the city of Normal in Illinois, just to make that clear up front. He may be a normal cop. I, I don't know what that even means, but it's a police officer from the city of Normal. <laughs> normal police officer accused of stealing money after a 911 call, which sounds like a normal thing a cop would do, even if he is from Normal. <laughs> the veteran Normal police officer accused of stealing and then trying to return $12,000 in cash from the residence of someone who overdosed last week. Brian Williams, 46, is charged with official misconduct and theft, Authorita said uh, on Sunday. Normal police said Williams is on administrative leave pending an internal investigation. Williams, an 18-year veteran of NPD, allegedly stole the cash on November 25th after responding to a 911 call at the Normal residence. One person at the scene later died at the hospital from an apparent drug overdose. A relative of that person later contacted normal police and reported $12,000 was missing, prosecutors said in court on Sunday. On November 27th, two days after the money went missing, the relative began receiving calls from an unidentified phone number. On November 28th, Thanksgiving Day, the relative spoke to the unknown caller who said he knew of the location of the stolen money, but that the relative needed to drop the investigation and quit speaking to police in order to have the money returned, prosecutors said. NPD referred the case to state police. With state police in the room, the relative agreed to meet the caller at the Pontiac gas station on Friday the 29th, state police set up surveillance of the gas station and saw Williams act suspiciously and leave the cash in a phone booth. Shortly thereafter, the relative received a call stating that the money had been left for the relative to pick up. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a normal cop to me. It sounds like something a normal cop would do. Um, just, just, just normal day-to-day -day police theft from normal people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, Cowboy Tech, uh, who else we got out there? Uh, um, uh, Hal, Anthony, um, um, who else we got out there? Uh, Lonnie, Lonnie Clark, do you listen? Do you all listen? Oregonians, tuned in, listening? This may be good news for y'all. Some actual good news out of Oregon. TechDirt.com posted December 2nd. Oregon Supreme Court shuts down pretextual traffic stops. Says cops cannot ask questions unrelated to the violation. The Supreme Court's Rodriguez decision took a lot of fishing line away from local law enforcement officers. Thousands of traffic statutes are violated every day, or not broken in some cases. Uh, yeah, not broken, m more often than not. Um, all an officer's officer needed to do was to follow someone around until they violated one of the turn, uh, violated one, and then turn the traffic stock into a Q&A session with an eye on obtaining consent for to search drivers, passengers, and vehicles. The Supreme Court said the pretextual stops are fine, but once the objective has been achieved, citation or warning giving, uh, the stop is over. No further questions. 
No calling for a drug dog. Nothing. Some officers took this to mean they could violate the Fourth uh, uh, Amendment as long as they did it quickly enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what they meant. Yeah, just be fast about it. Some courts allowed them to get away with speedy constitutional violations. But more often than not, courts interpreting the Supreme Court decision have read it as saying there is no extending a stop without reasonable suspicion to do so. There's some gray area, but not as much as officers had hoped. The Supreme Court of Oregon has almost completely revoked Law Enforcement's Fishing License. Um, its decision applying the, the state's constitution is more restrictive than the Rodriguez decision. There is no fishing, period. The court says even asking questions unrelated to the objective of the traffic stop is impermissible unless officers see, hear, or smell something that gives them reasonable suspicion to move past the objective or stop. Now, of course, a cop would never lie about seeing, hearing, or smelling something, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they're not allowed to. I don't mean they're not going to. The state argued that unavoidable lulls the moments between the officer's request for a license and registration and the driver's production of these documents could be filled with all sorts of unrelated questions. The officer in this case testified that he fired off a salvo of questions at the beginning of every traffic stop. Every time I walk up, I ask him, I say, hey, Officer Faulkner, Beaverton Police Department, do my uh, do do my contact with him. Do do you have anything illegal in the car? Would you consent to a search for guns, dry drugs, knives, bombs, illegal documents? What the hell's an illegal document, or anything else that you're not allowed to possess? The attempt to make it appear as though the questions the officers asked in this case were normal and not from normal Illinois. Normal actually showed the officer routinely asked questions that had nothing to do with the traffic stops he was performing. This is not exactly the message Officer Faulkner meant to send. Oh, it sure it is. It's absolutely the message that cop meant to send. But it's the message the Oregon Supreme Court received. As the court notes, this barrage of questions directed at a driver violates the state's constitution. Unlike a pedestrian encounter, drivers are not free to leave or ignore the or ignore questions. You're not really free as a pedestrian either, because if they they if you walk away from a cop, they're likely to tackle you and do all kinds of nasty things to you. In contrast to a person on the street who may unilaterally end an officer citizen encounter at any time, good luck with that. The reality is that a motorist stopped for a traffic infraction is legally obligated to stop at an officer's di direction and to interact with the officer, and therefore is not free unilaterally to end the encounter and leave whatever he or she chooses. Since none of this is consensual, attempting, attempting to obtain consent for a vehicle search before even addressing the objective of the traffic stop implicates state-given protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. The court says investigations should be limited to the alleged crime, and they're calling traffic stops a crime, at hand. A traffic stop is not the initial step in a deeper investigation of other potential criminal activity. <laughs> anyway, the article goes on, and, and they do have like a PDF embedded here of the, the Oregon Supreme Court's decision on that. But if you live in Oregon, uh, this is good news, or potentially good news for y'all. So, um, <laughs> oh, they're talking about normal now. <laughs> It did say Illinois, Gilberzilla. Uh, anyway, <laughs> see, 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 see where that pest, that pest thing comes from. <laughs> uh, oh, normal is in Illinois. 
It's a town in Illinois. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Next. Next. <laughs> Dailymail.co.uk. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. December 2nd, 2019. Good news, maybe. Possibly. Creepy. Creepy news. Good news. Yeah. Doctors bring a dead heart back to life by pumping it full of oxygen, blood, and electrolytes in groundbreaking procedure that could save the lives of thousands waiting for an organ transplant. Okay, the thing was dead. Dead. And you've brought it back to life. What you have now, if you ask me, from my perspective... Everything that I've picked up going through my life, this is a zombie heart. You now have a zombie heart. And you're going to implant it in somebody. <laughs> All right. Duke University doctors have reanimated a heart after its donor died in a first for the United States. Every day, 20 Americans die waiting for donated organs. Organs. Worldwide, there is a constant shortage of donor organs, and many go to waste because they can't be transplanted quickly enough. Typically, a donor heart must be harvested from a brain-dead donor whose heart is still beating to keep the tissue from dying too fast. Now, doctors use a technique called warm perfusion to reinvigorate the organ with blood. It was first done in the UK in 2015, and Duke has now become the first U.S. hospital to complete the donation after a cardiac health transplant. You know, I do believe, I do believe, I, I, we did cover this on the Freakers Ball. Um, so let me just uh, say this about it. It, it. it is potentially a terrific development, and it's probably something they could have been doing all along, but for whatever reason, they, they have decided not to. And, you know, when you transplant an organ into somebody with possible tissue damage, it's probable that that organ will be rejected by uh, the person it's being transplanted into, and therefore you'll, you'll have to quickly replace it with another uh, don donor organ. So I can understand them not wanting to do it. But in this case, they did it, and, and, and it seemed to have worked. Uh, so I, I think it's a good thing if uh, they could keep the person on the on the heart machine, keep their blood pumping, um, and, and wait for the the natural brain death if that is coming. As long as they don't hurry along the brain death, <coughs> unless unless that person says, "Do not resuscitate." Uh, don't don't try and keep me alive on it by any means. However, I'm an organ donor. Then um, go ahead and, and chill them down ahead of time. I guess uh, I, I I don't know. Um, but either way, if it, it's good to be able to get more organs to get them to transplant into people, I know it's huge business for the hospitals and, and the associated uh, industry they're involved. But if it keeps people alive who want to stay alive by giving them those organs, then that's a great deal. You know, I, I think it's a great deal. So, um, it's got its ups and downs to it, I, I do believe. But, uh, yeah, I, I, it's uh, it's an interesting little um, subject to, to kind of delve into there. They got little videos here in this article and stuff that you can watch the, the hearts pumping. Um, and and see how they're brought back to life, but you know how they're you know how it's done pretty much, I would think. Uh, whatever organ it is, as long as they keep the blood blood and oxygen flowing through it, um, and, and then then it's probably going to do just fine for some longer period of time. Uh, the, actually, the article I think I covered on this was from a different site uh, that that talked more about uh, uh, the actual donor rather than or the actual recipient. Uh, rather than, than the uh, possible donors that uh, this happens to. Either way, uh, it's a good article. Uh, it's, it's a good thing, or potentially a good thing, and um, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. 
uh, as long as they're not killing people to get the organs, which we know some of them do. Because, like I said, there's a lot of money involved, a lot of money involved in, in uh, organ transplants. I mean, you know, they even have people that, that black market steal uh, organs from people. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of money. All right, now this next one is, is a potentially a disastrous, disastrous situation. Although I don't really see it happening. <laughs> potentially disastrous. Posted on KATU2 or KATU.com, uh, KTAU2 on your side here. On uh, December 3rd of 2019, weak potato harvest could cause French fry shortage across the United States. Oh, no! Not my French fries! <laughs> According to a Bloomberg report, the United States may face a French fry shortage. This report says that uh, this is due to a poor potato crop. According to CNN, cold and wet weather this year has stunted the growth of potatoes. Retailers rely on long potatoes to make french fries. Uh, but there might not be enough of those to go around. So instead of you, you know, having a 4 or 5 inch potato, uh, I mean a, a 7 or 8 inch long french fry, you might have a 4 or 5 inch long french fry. And, oh, the horror! <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> potato producers told Bloomberg uh, that they are having to turn, foreign, turn to foreign producers to help make up for the loss. French fry demand has just been outstanding lately, and so supplies can't meet demand. Travis Blacker, Industry Relations Director at the Idaho Potato Commission, told Bloomberg... Uh, the potato crop forecast for the United States is at the lowest since 2010, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This could mean consumers might see higher prices for, for potatoes at the grocery store. Yeah, well, you know, they're about a dollar a pound. I, I think if they went up to a dollar twenty-five a pound, yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> well, you see, for a baked potato, you don't need the long potatoes. <laughs> so I think you'd be all right there. For mashed potatoes, it just don't matter the size of the potatoes. <laughs> I just <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, I go to the grocery store and there's just huge bins of potatoes. You could buy a ten pound bag for four dollars and a five pound bag for two fifty or three dollars. So, yeah, I think I'll be all right on potatoes. Now, maybe they're not all these big, long potatoes they like to make the French fries out of. Eh. Eh. <laughs> all right. All right. Maybe you are not aware, but Oxford does a thing called Word of the year. Word of the year. Yes, higher prices, absolutely. That fixes it. Once you raise the prices, there's no more shortage. It's not that they're selling any more or less potatoes. It's just the higher prices fixes it. Kind of like this thing here. <laughs> Posted on What's Up With That on, De on December 3rd here. Oxford has a word of the year. And this year, the word is climate emergency. But wait, that's two words. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes, Oxford Climate. Oxford names climate emergency its 2019 word of the year. On Thursday, November 21st, Amid historic flooding in Venice, Italy, and catastrophic brush bushfires decimating Australia's koala population, Oxford has named its word of the year, Climate Emergency. Oxford said it, selects, uh, it selected words or phrases that reflect the ethos, mood, or preoccupations of the passing year. Passing year. And this year, 
heightened awareness of the fake-ass climate science and its implications have generated tremendous debate. Previous words of the year include toxic, youth quake, post-truth, and vape. And in 2015, face with, face with tears of joy emoji. An emoji was the word of the year, and it's a face with tears of joy. But anyway, let's look at the previous words of the year and how they might relate to this word of the year. Toxic, youth quake, post-truth. Well, climate emergency is not only a toxic term, it's also a post-truth post term and coming from a youth quake. <laughs> a youth quake. Uh, Greta, yeah. Anyway, going on here. Climate emergency is two words and a fake phrase, but at least they're two real words. Youth quake? Really? Furthermore, <laughs> how could an actual climate emergency reflect the ethos, mood, or preoccupations of the passing year? Existential threats are not limited to time engagements. <laughs> Adapted. <laughs> oh, they got some videos here. Emergency. Everybody uh, to get everybody to get from street. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, so. I, <laughs> Oxford, seriously, what's up? What's up, Oxford? <laughs> All right, previously, in the past, I should say, previously, I have talked about the Cosmic Crisp Apple. Cosmic Crisp. It's a new lab invented version of an apple and it, and, it, and it's it's like the honey crisp apple except it's a little different in several ways the, the the cosmic crisp apples have a like a pattern like a star pattern on them they're really neat looking and i i mean even though uh, the seeds were created uh, in a lab I, I they they look really good i i would try these um Assuming, you know, with, with those that are grown without the pesticides and such on them. But here it is. The new, oh, where is this posted at? Uh, WMC Action News 5, uh, December 3rd. The new Cosmic Crisp apples are good for a whole year in your fridge. A year. Put an apple in the fridge, it's good for a freaking year. Is this an apple for the modern age? An apple that could last up to a year in a refrigerator is starting to hit grocery store shelves across the U.S. It took researchers and farmers two decades to make the Cosmic Crisp Apple. The new variety is a mixture of Enterprise and Honey Crisp apples and was developed at Washington State University. The apple got its name from the little bright spots that resemble the stars in the sky. The acidity of the Cosmic Crisp apple supposedly prevents it from turning brown as quickly as other apples, its developers say. Only 450,000 boxes are available this year, but in 2020 there should be more than 2 million boxes. Now they got some uh, little videos here showing you these apples. Uh, there's a little uh, a tweet here. It says, This sweet, delicious, crisp apple is shipping from Washington State to, produ to produce departments nationwide starting December 1st. The best way to ensure cosmic crisp apples are available in your local store is to ask your produce retailer. The following stores have, uh, re been, uh, have, re have been reported by consumers to stock cosmic crisp while supplies last, and, and, and it's here in a little video that you can check out. But I'm interested to try these apples. I, I'm a big fan of the apples, and apples have become bastardized over the, the, the recent many years uh, due to the fact that they spray all the apples with, with pesticides, heavy, heavily 
with pesticides, uh, which I, I understand bugs like apples. Everything likes apples. And, and then, okay, maybe you could wash that off. It's on the outside of the apple, right? They, they, they put that stuff on the outside of the apple. Uh, so you could, you could wash off your apples. However, before you get the apple, before that apple gets to your grocery store, when the apple pickers pick them and they put them in the processing area, they, they coat the apples with a wax, uh, a waxy type substance. So that poison is on the apple skin underneath that waxy substance. So the only real way, I mean, you can really scrub and scrub and scrub that apple, but the only real way to, to handle it is to peel the apple prior to eating it, which is not really that big of a deal But uh, if you're going to eat it right away. But if you're going to save it, like you're going to put some apples in your lunch if you go take a lunch to work or something like that, um, unless you're going to peel it there at work, uh, you know, because you can't peel an apple and just let it sit. It'll turn brown or it get mushy. It's just not good. So what? what uh, no, 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 no. I didn't say lab-created apples are healthier. I'm just saying that these are probably very tasty. And 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 if they if you could get them minus the poison, I would like them minus the poison and the wax. And if they're good for a year, there's really no reason to put the wax on them other than to make them shiny, which is appealing to people. <laughs> did I did I say they were healthier? I don't think I said they were healthier. I don't think it says that anywhere in here. Um, <laughs> Just that they last longer in your fridge. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'd like to get some of the seeds and grow some myself. Uh, of course, it takes a long time to grow an apple from seed. Uh, man, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, I, 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 yeah, I do. All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is this next story will be the last story of the night, and. Um, it was traumatizing for the for the subject of the story. It's kind of traumatizing for me to read it. Ah, not really. <laughs> Posted December fifth on NewYorkPost.com, <laughs> NY Post. Oh God, Duck has traumatized penis removed after nonstop sex. Yeah, baby. That duck was getting it on. (laughs) Oh, Dave had too many duck buddies. The UK-based quacker was forced to have his traumatized penis surgically removed after it became infected due to his insatiable sex drive. Dave reportedly engaged in foul play with flocks of lady ducks on the regular. (laughs) <laughs> Dave's owner, Josh Watson of Torquay, Devon, said his nymphomaniac pet would mate with his female companions, Dora, Edith, and Frida, between five and ten times a day, even when it wasn't mating season. It got to the point where his threesome partners would wander off during sex and even peck at his pecker to ward off his unwanted advances. Unfortunately, the horny Drake uh, paid the ultimate price for his amorous activities. His member became gangrenous. Uh, the end of his penis had basically died, and it was pretty horrific. It started not going in, and uh, we'd, ha- we'd give him a bath to keep it clean. When antibiotics failed to remedy the problem, Watson took Dave to Bristol Eyecroft Veterinary Hospital. A veterinary Sonia Miles said the overuse and him being far too amorous had caused Dave's member to prolapse and become septic, a condition that be- could become life-threatening if untreated. So they lopped off his putrid phallus, leaving only a centimeter stub behind. Fortunately, Dave can still urinate. The duck's penis is only used for sex. The stumpy sex fiend is faring just fine after the operation because he's quite resilient for a duck, said Watson, but he speculates that Dave feels pretty upset 
about losing his willy. However, Dave's lack of a penis won't stop him from attempting to mate, according to Miles, to, temp uh, to temper Dave's temptations and help him recover from surgery. Watson has since separated Duck uh, Dave from his feathery uh, bed fellows. <laughs> Poor Dave! He had, his, he had his caddy whacker whacked off. Oh. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. <laughs> as I've mentioned previously and at the top of the show, uh, Grim Leftovers will not be on next week or the week following, but we'll return at the beginning of 2020 uh, to regale you with more of these wonderful stories from the various news outlets that are out there. Uh, Frickers Ball will still be on on the next two Fridays, as it's supposed to be. And this Friday will be the Christmas, the annual holiday slash Christmas show. So get your Christmas requests in for that program prior to Friday evening at 11 p.m. Eastern. And we'll try and get them on. We'll get on as, much, as many as we can. Um, the Friday after that, the 27th, will be our annual prediction show where we go through last year's predictions and talk about this year's new predictions and record those. So if you have predictions, and hopefully real predictions, not predictions like uh, Vinny's going to become a transgender or something like that. Not that I'm suggesting you predict that. I'm not. I'm suggesting just the opposite. Don't suggest that. <laughs> Don't predict that. <laughs> Even though maybe maybe you think it's going to happen. I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking probably not. Anyway, try to get some real predictions in, you know, of whatever that may be. Uh, political, global, atmospheric, uh, any any of those, those things. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that. All the rest of the shows, as far as I know will be on normal schedule. Um, on Tuesdays uh, is, is, is the, uh, the, the program uh, In a Perfect World with Flash and Vinny, uh, which that show is moving up two hours or back. How do you think of it? Instead of being on at, 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 at 1 p.m. Eastern, it'll be on at 3 p.m. Eastern. So is that up or back? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> two hours forward on the clock uh, starting tomorrow but i doubt they'll be on 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 the uh, 24th or the 31st maybe they will i don't know but that's christmas eve and new year's eve now on uh wednesday we have our our new show uh w w with lonnie clark uh but uh, which is at noon eastern uh which probably will be on this week but not the following week because that's christmas day so just kind of have to work a little bit uh, around around the uh, holiday schedule, uh, so it probably won't be on New Year's Day either. I I don't know. I, I don't know what her schedule is and how she does things. I I welcome her doing shows on both of those days, uh, as well as I welcome Flash and Vinny doing their shows on on the eves. You know, so uh, however that works, that'll be great. Um, I do also believe that the, the Dork Table will go from noon to 2 p.m. Eastern, so uh, I, that, that is the plan as far as I'm aware, or been made aware. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's all that. Um, I guess that's all. Uh, have a great rest of your year. Uh, good holiday season, holiday Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever it is, whatever. <laughs> you'll have a great Yule celebration, uh, Hanukkah, I, I don't know, whatever you do. It's all good, man, it's all good. Um, where, where's my deal? Where's my deal? Oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, we'll talk to you all later. Peace!